Hello and welcome to another Dominion 6 Deep Dives. In this episode we're going to go over the basic idea of thugging. Thugs perform the same role as raiders in war, attacking behind the front lines at less defended provinces where enemy armies are less likely to be around. While raiding forces can sometimes be quite large depending on the nation that you're playing, thugs are designed to go alone or with little help and usually cost more in gems than they do in gold, so you can leverage both of your economies in a war. They are likely to have some form of enhanced movement, magic phase movement, stealth or very high map move, in order to perform the guerrilla style attacks. Technically, you can thug pretty much any chassis in the game if you're willing to spend enough magical gems and equipment for them. A scout fully slotted out with artifacts can probably take over an enemy province with low amounts of PD, but that's a massive gem investment for really not that much return. Good choices for thugs are any unit that has good starting stats and equipment. The less gems and mage turns you invest into them in order to make them effective, the better. Thugs that are mages already are usually a preference, though not always a requirement depending on your plan for them. I'd like to preface as well before going into this topic any deeper, a lot of people in the Dominion 6 community, myself included, think that thugs are not as effective as they were in previous versions of the game. This is mostly due to the increased gold in Dominion 6, which increases the number of troops and PD that you're likely to find in the game. This means that for some older builds for thugs, they may not function quite as well as they did previously. If you're not sure if a thug is effective, why not create a test environment for yourself in a test game using the arena map, which will give you a better idea of how to use your thug in the future. I've got a link to the arena map down below in the description. So what does a thug need in order to be effective? I'll list out here what I think a thug wants. So when you're making your thug, consider the following. The opportunity cost, how to deal with enemies, outlasting your opponents, having enhanced map move, low additional investment, do you need any supporting units, and also consider what stage of the game you're at and if there's any counters that you know on the field already. So the first point I want to make is the opportunity cost. I think this is probably the most important thing to consider when you're making your thug. You want to keep your thugs low cost as it keeps them an effective tool in your arsenal. To use a thug requires turns to recruit or summon it, mage turns and gems to outfit it, costing even more gems if you trade for the items that you need in a multiplayer game, and gold to pay for any additional units going along with them. When you're thinking of outfitting your thug, keep in mind your mage turns. What else could you use your mages for? Are you sacrificing any of your research? Should you be sight searching with them instead? Should they be following your armies around doing something more productive? If you have more crucial things to be spending your mage or fort recruitment turns on, then maybe this thug isn't the bee's knees you think it is. Think about as well the cost when you're making the thug. How much it's going to cost you in gold and resources and additional magical gems in order to make the items that you're thinking of making for it. Could you be using your fort turns to make something else? More commanders for your armies, more mages for more research, or to support your armies instead? Are they worth the investment you're making? Finally, do you care? Remember, losing is fun, and actually the game is to have fun. If you want to make a thug, make a thug, especially in single player. Do what you want. If you're going to use them in multiplayer, give it a little bit more thought. When you're thinking of making a thug, decide what its role is going to be before you start making items for it, and before you start sending them out. If you're wanting to make a light thug, a unit with few supporting units and not that much gem investment in terms of items, that's great. Make sure you stick to this doctrine for your thug when sending them into battle. If you start sending them into armies and they die, or you send them against defense they weren't kitted out for, it wasn't necessarily the thug that was at fault, it was how you used them. This is the hardest point to teach, and it depends entirely on your current situation, how many mages and gems you have, and your own personal gain knowledge in order to determine it. So get testing on single player till the cows come home. If you start to throw your thugs into unfavorable situations, you have a much greater chance of them getting things like afflictions, which will reduce their combat effectiveness, and they can potentially die, at which point you've lost all the gems and the gold that you've invested into your thug, and who knows if you've even made your money back. Consider as well ways of making your thugs cheaper. If you know that you have a specific unit that you're wanting to thug, and you can make a blast for them that will help with this, then do that pretender design, so at least then you're only using some design points and it's not costing you anything in the game. Okay, moving on to the second point. How do you deal with enemies? Well, in order for a thug to be effective, it has to be able to deal with the foes they're facing. If a thug cannot clear enemy forces, they will eventually be chip damaged down to the point where they will flee or be killed, unless they're at pretender levels of health or have incredible layered defenses. 
So how do you deal with your enemies? Well, the simplest one is to just kill them. You can kill your enemies in a variety of ways. The first was through normal attacks, things like using good attack skill and AoE damage, especially if it's combined with a unit that already has multi-attack or has quickness cast them. Additionally, spells can be used any spells with high range or high AoE, or that summon additional units in battle, using things like Swarm, Illusionary Army, or Horde of Skeletons. You can use Tramplers, you can use Breath Attacks, or you can use Auras, things like Heat, Cold, and Poison, in order to help kill the enemies. These are all potential options you have so that your thug is able to deal with enemy forces, and what you have depends on the unit you're using, what magical paths you have access to, and any accompanying buffer or fluffer units they have, and what magical items you can forge. It is very unlikely, however, that you will have to kill every enemy unit on the field. You will win a battle versus independence or province defense if you can get them to flee the field. The most effective way to get militia or basic defense units to run is through morale checks, either through wounding 80% of a squad through a large AoE, killing enough of them so they're taking lots of squad morale checks, or through fear. Fear or dread will allow your thug to not have to kill too many of the independent troops if they can outlast them, more on that in the next section, and simply have them run away due to failing their individual or squad morale checks versus the fear or dread. This is what lets expanders like the Arsenic that rely on fear take provinces. The reason you want to use area of effect damage or multiple attacks is due to the difference in the action economy between you and the defenders. As your thug begins to get surrounded, they will have less actions per round in comparison to the enemies they are fighting, and they will begin to get more and more worn down through chip damage and harassment as the enemies begin to surround them. So removing enemies will reduce the numbers hitting at once. Additionally, you can use fatigue plays in order to fatigue units surrounding you out. These are usually done through things like heat or chill auras in order to exhaust those units surrounding you so you're taking less attacks, thereby swinging the action economy more in your favor. So what are common thug damaging spells? Well, they're usually quick to cast low magical path spells that either have high range for the first few scripts or have a large AoE. We're talking about spells, for example, like Shockwave, Fire Blast, Immolation, or Cold Blast, as examples of some of the low range spells with big AoE for dealing with close enemies. While for longer range spells, you have things like Thunder Strike for a far larger range with still a decent area of effect as well. Typically in a script, the lower range spells will be scripted later, after you've gotten your initial buffs off in the first few combat rounds. If you're focusing more on killing your enemies, rather than just fearing them out, then you have to be very mindful of your thug's fatigue, especially on trampling thugs or berserking thugs. Should your thug fatigue make its way to 100, they'll no longer be able to attack, and they will most likely be unable to rout the enemy force, and instead be killed themselves through armor-defeating blows while they sleep to recover the fatigue. Okay, let's move on to part three of this list, outlasting your enemies. In order for a thug to kill enough enemies to get them to rout or last long enough for their fear effects or routes to occur, they have to be able to take near to no damage from an average enemy hit. You can do this through a few methods, and you can combine these to become tankier as well, and they come as follows. Protection, both armored and natural. Defense skill, including unsurrendable to get rid of harassment penalties. Resistances, both physical and elemental, hit reduction to reduce the total number of hits that you take, hit mitigation to reduce the damage of hits that go through, regeneration, both passive and active versions, strike back effects to help clear out chaff, and fatigue plays to reduce the total number of hits you're receiving. Natural protection is probably the easiest to explain. Casting spells such as stone skin, bark skin, or iron skin, or wearing something like an amulet of bark skin, Will increase your unit's natural protection and make them more able to reduce or negate damage taken by normal attacks. This will work in addition to the protection gained from equipment like armor or shields, which will either come as the unit is recruited or from equipment that you forged or found and given to your thug. Remember as well that forged body armors will usually add additional health points in Dominion 6 as well. If it's possible, don't rely on just one type of defense. You want to use multiple defenses, if possible, in order to have the most chances of reducing any incoming chip damage, because out of a large enough force, enough chip damage becomes a lot damage. So, having a high protection in combination with a high defense skill will make it so that your thug will be 1. Hard to hit, and 2. When they get hit, less likely to take more than chip damage, even if it's an armor-defeating roll. 
This is especially true for mounted thugs, where attacks can be split between the rider and the mount and those who are unsurroundable, so they will take less harassment penalties. You can get things like these through magical items or blesses. Next we have resistances, such as elemental or poison, if you're against a problems defense that uses that kind of damage, such as fire resistance versus early age abyssia, for example, or physical resistances against blunt, slashing, or pierce damage, which you can get through blesses like fortitude, or spells like scales of body, temper flesh, liquid body. Physical resistances will half the amount of damage you take from a specific physical damage type, which will then reduce the hard hits into chip damage. This combined with a high protection will make your thug last far longer than they otherwise would. For elemental resistances, the number next to the resistance is how much the damage is reduced by, plus an additional two times the number as a percent reduction in the remaining damage that you're going to take. Meaning that you can get to resistance levels where you're barely taking any elemental or poison damage. Especially useful if you're casting spells like Shockwave or Immolation that also can damage the caster. Hit reduction effects are split into two different categories. Hit stopping, which are things like Awe, or Air Shield, or Body Ethereal, which just flat out stop the hit from happening. You additionally also have hit reduction spells, such as Blur or Mirror Images, which make it so that the hit is less likely to actually go through. Additionally, if you're using a longer weapon, you can use a Repelling Thug, where they try and stop basic infantry from attacking them purely through repelling, they probably don't have the morale to finish up with their attack. Hit negation on the other hand is to prevent the hits that do go through your various forms of protection through random chance that they don't do that much damage. Things like mist form or moss body to give you a massive damage reduction or flying shields to give you even more protective force against any incoming damage. This also pairs quite well with physical resistances too. You also have damage negation, things like Twist Fate or Luck, which also work. Though the former is one time only, and the latter is if your thug would die if the hit went through. This does however work with an undying bless, so do keep that in mind. Regeneration is very useful on thugs with larger hit pools. It means they'll be able to recover from the chip damage they receive while they're dealing with the enemy. You can get this through spells like Personal Regen, a unit's base features, a Regen Bless, or giving them something like a Ring of Regeneration, which can be a good idea for your thugs with higher HP pools. With a high enough HP pool, or multiple forms, you can regen through your lack of other defensive options, but again, you shouldn't solely rely on it. Additionally, you can think of attacks or spells that cause life drain, such as Soul Vortex, akin to regeneration, and that will help you keep an already tanky thug alive. For strike back effects, you have things such as Flame Shield, Fate Weaving, Damage Reversal, or Sight Vengeance. These are split into two different categories, damaging strike backs and future damage reduction. For example, a tanky thug with a Flame Shield could be a very good way of clearing out chaff as they attack them, they will then take damage back on themselves. The same again with Damage Reversal, especially because usually Province Defense or Independent Forces don't have the best magic resistance. If you want to reduce the amount of damage you're going to take in the future, th things such as Sight Vengeance, or in this case Psy Vengeance, will remove the sight of units that attack your thug, making them less likely to hit in the future. And Fate Weaving will also screw up any of your opponent's future rolls. Finally, we have Fatigue Thugs, who will try and fatigue out their opponents through Reinvigoration and Aura effects like Chill Aura. When it comes to Fatigue Recovery, you want to get things like Reinvigoration through items, blesses, or spells like Summon Earth Power, or using other forms of reinvigoration, such as Soul Drain, to steal it from your foes. Additionally, you want to try and think of a way that you can give fatigue to your enemies. This is through things such as spells like Desiccation, or auras through your Cold or your Heat Aura. The Cold Aura specifically can also remove your enemy's ability to fight by freezing those around you, especially in colder provinces. This will tie up the number of units that can be in those squares that can act, and give your thug a little bit of breathing room. A heat aura will simply set your enemies on fire, which will kill them. Nice. Remember that the most important thing to consider when you're thinking of your thug's script is knowing who they are fighting. Not having your air thug cast something like air shield when versus horse tribe archers, for example, is a terrible idea. Likewise, fighting shades without a way to do any kind of magical damage or having some kind of magical weapon will likely end in disaster. Knowing who you are fighting and changing your strategy and equipment based on that is half the battle before your thug is even underway. Okay, so now that your thug has a way of getting rid of opponents and a way to outlast them so they won't die in a single battle, what else are you looking for? Well, map movement is very important. The whole idea of them is they are able 
to be mostly independent from your main forces to help deal with an enemy's backline. If they have stealth, then they can attack a province and stealth away the next turn. Perfect for hit and run tactics versus your opponents. If they have fly, then they have a much better chance of reaching backline provinces away from the front line, where they are much less likely to run to armies. Magic phase movement, like Cloud Trapeze, is also nice for thugs as a way to get them far into enemy territories very quickly, but it is more useful on super combatants to enable them to guarantee a hit on an enemy army. You can also use items like Boots of the Messenger to give your thugs much higher map move than they otherwise would, in order for them to be more independent. If you have to bring an entourage or buffers or fluffers with them in order to do their job, then this obviously gets harder to do. Now we get on to the tricky part. What additional equipment does your thug need in order to do their job? Well, if they're something like a Black Lord, then they probably don't need much gem investment in their equipment in order to do their job. They're an okay light raider as it is, and it's quite costly in terms of opportunity cost, what you get back from them if you outfit them too much. Something like an Eagle King from Kalem probably needs a helmet in order to do their job, in order to protect their heads, as they already have the magic pass to protect themselves all right, but if a stray arrow or something hits them in the head, it's only fire protection. You give them a black steel helmet, which is very easy to make, and all of a sudden that's 24 protection, and they get their protection gets much better. Slap on a stone skin and a mist form, and they'll be pretty well defended against normal attacks. Take this in comparison to something like early age Pyrene's Tartalos. These guys are going to need armor, both body and a head slot, due to their pretty bad armor as it stands and they have no magic to buff themselves up, so they're going to need another mage with them, or additional gear to make them more survivable. And although that single club strike does a lot of damage, it won't be enough to deal with lots of enemies, so they'll need another weapon just to be a passable thug. This is quite a lot of turn investments from mages and gems in order to make them something beyond even just a light raider. So how can you make it so that you need less equipment investments for your lighter thugs and raiders? Well, the easiest way to do this is to give them additional troops. There's nothing wrong with giving your thugs additional troops to go with them while they're on a mission. There don't have to be many, just enough to supplement your thug while they do their work. These can be things like flyers or cavalry set to hold and attack rear to hopefully help you snipe out enemy commanders while your thug either battles the enemy's frontline troops or do it the other way around where your normal troops are tagging up the enemy's frontline before your thug goes in for a final strike. Remember, if you take out all of the enemy's commanders, then you will win the battle. And most province defenses don't have very strong commanders, making this a very useful way of winning. It does mean that, as well that rather than spending gems for a thug, you're spending gold for supporting troops instead. Going back to the Tartalo, they are able to summon their own chaff, Mufalons. These Mufalons are then able to assist them pretty well. It's quite important that the supporting troops are able to keep up with your light thug as well while they do their job. Troop summoners, such as death mages that can cast horde of skeletons or nature mages using swarm, can bring their own troops into battle without them being slowed down on the strategic map. Remember to keep an eye on what battlefield summons you can cast to augment your thugs, and remember as well that you can also bring items, such as a bottle of living water, in order to bring a water elemental as a retinue. Keep these in mind when you're building your thugs, and see if you can find a cheap option to supplement your forces. Finally, don't be scared of using more than one thug at a time. Having multiple thugs work as a group together to take provinces can be cheaper than only using one, having to outfit them with far more magical gear, especially if you can make do with cheap magical items. The last point I made is to make sure that your thugs aren't being used at a point where they can already be countered. Thugs will usually be countered by higher levels of research giving them save or suck spells for them to defend against, and that's kind of by design. In order to make it so that your thug is so defended against everything that your component could potentially throw at them, they would be far too costly to get any real benefit out of them, and they could just die as well. If so, if you know that your opponent is, if you know your opponent is capable of casting things such as Soul Slay, Mind Burn, or Life for a Life, it can start to get quite dangerous for your thugs to start operating alone, but that's okay, you can incorporate them into your armies where they can become part of your supplementary force. If you're in a game and you're having trouble with enemy thugs in the early game, recruit a couple of commanders on the cheaper side and give them great weapons of sharpness and send a few after them. 
multiple great swords of sharpness against a single thug with a bit of an additional pd to help you as well have a very good chance of killing a basic kitted thug especially something relying on something like mist form that doesn't want to meet somebody with a magic weapon okay so that's a general overview of your thought process of what to think about while you're thugging so what kind of items could you outfit a thug with well, obviously that's going to depend on your construction level and available paths. I'll try and give you some generic items that you can use from all magical paths. So, helmets. With a lot of your mages and some of your commanders, especially looking at you early HR, they will not be wearing head protection. A construction one using either of these helmets are straight up better than nothing. So use them so they don't get bonked on the head by a sling and just straight up die. At higher levels of construction, you're looking at things like the horned helmet, which will add in another attack for your thug which is especially good on a thug that casts quickness or an already strong thug, or a horror helm, or a spirit mask. The horror helm will give you fear, which is a great way of dealing with independent forces by making them just fear route rather than having to kill them. And the spirit mask is something similar where instead it will cast frighten automatically throughout the battle, so it's not just centered around your thug. It is a little bit more expensive, however. If you have the Death Glamour Path, something like the Crown of the Whispering Dead, while not great for protection, can be very, very useful for its Nightmare Aura, letting it do lots of damage to large area of people around it. Additionally for helmets later on, getting something like a Spirit Helmet for automatic lightning bolts, an Iron Face for Iron Skin can also be quite nice as well. Though again, these can get rather costly. If you're looking for a one-handed weapon, the classics are things like the Mace of Eruption, the Thunder Whip, or any of the brands, Frost, Fire, or Shadow. This is due to their area effect damage where they hit. Don't overlook as well, however, the snake bladder stick, especially if you have a thug with a little bit of poison resistance, the poison cloud can do quite a lot of damage to unresistant troops. Additionally, with all of these AOE weapons, on a thug with high enough defense skill already, you can potentially dual wield these for multiple area of effect attacks per turn, which are doubled again if you have quickness. For the two-handed weapons, your earlier weapons are more actually anti-thug than for clearing out chaff. Things such as your Great Sword of Sharpness or your Halberd of Might. At level 5 construction, however, you get access to things like the Flame Bow for use against Undead. Though do be careful as Undead are quite resistant to a lot of your Thug tricks like your Fear of Fatigue tricks in order to deal with them easily. The Shock Trident is another way of doing large amounts of chaining damage as well and is actually pretty good against Giants, so keep that in your back pocket. A Wraith Sword or a Hell Sword will also give you Partial Life Drain, which is good for a Quickness Thug. And the Implementer Axe shouldn't be overlooked because it gives a lot of fear for a two-handed weapon. Finally, you have something like the Carmine Cleaver, which does give you a fire shield, but it's quite late in the game and it is fairly costly. So you need to think about whether or not that'd be worth it, or if you should just have your thug cast fire shield themselves. Remember as well, if you're going to use a two-handed weapon, make sure your thug has enough defense that they won't get hit all the time. For shields, if you're using a one-handed weapon and you want something that gives you protection or get extra effects, you get Sight Vengeance from the Eye Shield, Fire Shield from the Charcoal Shield, Awe from the Shield of Gleaming Gold, and there's the old classic Vine Shield that will root out two squares around you every turn. If you already have a bit of Shock Resistance as well, the Skuata Volturnus is also very good as it will automatically cast the spell Shocking Grasp every turn, which can be quite nice. When it comes to body armor, you mostly want protections. So for something like that, Black Steel Plate is a good choice. If your thug can't cast any natural protection buffs, a Lion's Pelt with his 18 invulnerability and decent enough health and body protection on top of that make it a pretty good shout, especially for its price point. Later on, something like Hydra Skin Armor for the inbuilt regen, Jade Armor for the inbuilt quickness, or just the plain Armor of Knights for the cheap cost but high protection, are all pretty good shouts. If you want to outfit your thugs with boots, obviously Boots the Messenger are the most common choice. Just due to their reinvigoration and map move, both things thugs really like. But you could potentially use any combination of boots that you want. You could potentially make trampling thugs with Boots the Behemoth, flying ones with winged shoes, or use any of the boosters or resists that you need. It's very much up to the thug and what you need them to do for which one you want to use. As for the miscellaneous slots, it really depends on the thug chassis and what magical paths you have available to you for what you want to use. But as always, additional armor, reinvigoration, or regeneration are all big pluses for a thug. You could potentially also use something like a temporary gem generator for magic using thugs too, just to remove a little bit of gem logistics as well. Even if they aren't using gem using spells, it'll just keep their fatigue down in battle so they can do other things. A special shout out should be made to the stone birds 
who attack up to eight times per round and can be another way for you to deal with regular province defense and as always lifelong protection for a very expensive but funny one to two imps every single battle round finally when it comes to barding it's really only useful for mounted thugs but it is very good for those that are riding things like face steeds or those whose mounts don't have much armor to begin with slap a barding on them to improve the protection great you're good to go your thug will last much longer Remember, while it's nice to think about all the cool items you could give your thugs and how effective they will be with them, remember that each of these magical items will cost you not only gems, but a mage turn to make. If your thug doesn't need every magical item in the world to do their job, don't make it for them. So what tactics should you do with thugs? Well, if we imagine a front line, we want to try and hit provinces that are away from the front line. The main reason to do this is to avoid enemy armies if you're just attacking with your thugs. Your thugs can deal with some troops, but probably not a proper army with mage support by themselves. You'll just die and you've given your enemies some free magical items. By attacking weakened provinces away from support, you immediately cut your enemy off from their income and this will hurt his economy. Secondly, he will either need to make new forces or divert some existing ones towards your thugs in order to deal with his lost provinces, meaning less troops are fighting against your main armies. If your thug can distract a higher gold cost of troops into chasing them and cause enough economic damage, then they've done their role. Also, don't be scared to use your thugs for larger battles, especially if they're coming in with your army to support them. Just don't let them wade in in front of your troops and fight the whole army by themselves. Putting a flying thug in with your army can be a good way of giving your enemies a headache to deal with, especially if they manage to snipe an enemy commander while attacking the rear. So we've talked about ideas for thugs for a while, so why don't I show you some example thugs. We'll start with two national thugs and then we'll go on to two generic summon thugs. So the Black Lord from Middle Age Elm is probably the lightest kind of thug you can make. With a small entourage of about 5 to 10 Black Knights they can regularly take lightly defended provinces but don't expect them to win outright against tougher enemies. It isn't required to but you can give them a mace of eruption on top of their base gear just to give them a little bit of area effect damage in order to help them clear out chaff easier. The beauty of a light raiding thug like this, the beauty of a light raiding thug like this is they only take one commander recruitment point to make, meaning you can also work on half a mage turn on them, or a full mage if you have an Ulmish Citadel up, and they have good enough base equipment to be run with very little magical investment, maybe one or two items and a couple of knights to help out. You can have a lot of these guys running around alone or converging in groups with other black lords, and they can be quite annoying to deal with. They are mages, however, they can't buff themselves, and if you're adding in a mage su to support them, it really isn't feasible due to how much slower they would be on the main map. Have them and a few knights hold on attack and rear in order to take out the enemy commanders, and they should be able to take over provinces pretty well. Good basic and simple light thugs and raiders for you to get used to how others would operate without having to worry about scripting. So to give an example for our one, we've got two black lords here, both of them armed with a mace of eruption, they have an entourage of five black knights each. Both are on hold and attack rear, and they're just going to charge in and give battle to the enemy. So we can see here that in this one, we have an independent force of not so many people, a couple of slingers, a little bit of a mage support as well, nothing too worried about. So we're just going to hold for two turns, and then we're just going to attack. You can see here that we have our black knights running forward. They're going to charge into the commanders, and then in come our black lords as well. Fantastic, we're just taking out all of their troops, taking out their commanders, and it's nice and simple, nothing to really write home about. So for our next thug, let's talk about the Buddha. The Buddha is an interesting mage available to early age Machaka. They're fire, earth, death mages that can also shape change into werehyners, which are stealthy. Because of their two forms, they actually have surprisingly high amount of HP for use against provinces with small amounts of PD or small independent forces. In this example, I have a Buddha that I'm going to use to attack a medium-sized independent army of about 100 men. The Buddha's outfitted with a skull staff just to boost up his death magic, boots the messenger, and a girdle of might for reinvigoration. As for his script, we've got him casting Summon Earth Power. This is going to give him a little bit of reinvigoration and some earth magic bonus. And then Invulnerability, which grants invulnerability of 25. This is now better in my mind than say iron skin was in dominions 5 because iron skin only gives you plus 13 to your natural protection rather than setting it at, i think it was 20 i can't even remember now whereas invulnerability grants you invulnerability 25 so you have 25 natural protection against mundane attacks which is really really good next up he's going to cast soul vortex so what that's going to do is going to cause one armor negating magic resistance negates damage to everybody around him and then it's going to restore his own health and endurance so i help him re 
reinvigorate himself, uh, help him heal up from any damage that he takes in both of his forms. Next up, he's going to be casting Temper Flesh, which gives him Slash, Blunt, and Pierce Resistance. So if anybody's able to get through that uh, invulnerability 25 protection against mundane attacks, he's then going to be taking half damage from any of the damage that goes through, which is really, really nice against mundane troops. And then finally, he's going to be casting Fire Shield. A Fire Shield that does fire damage to anybody who attacks him, which is great. And then after that, he's just going to be casting spells for the rest of the battle. As for his setup, we're setting him up right at the back here so he can get enough time to cast his entire script before dealing with the enemy army. Okay, so having a little look at this force, uh, it seems the scouts were vastly overestimating how many mutants there were. That's absolutely fine. We're going to get our script off for our Buddha. He's going to just cast up his stuff here he's got all of his buffs going on he's even cast iron skin as well i'm gonna look at his fatigue he's at 76 fatigue which isn't the best but isn't the worst and he's going to be able to just uh, it seems like he's buffing up those skeletons that he's summoned he's getting a bolt of on life off and he's just going to start healing up from these guys here who are attacking him that's absolutely fine they've got absolutely no chance of getting through his protection he did also cast an iron skin off script just to make sure that he is going to be okay and he's going to raise even more undead so he's bringing his own army with them and then he's giving them some buffs as well a couple of flying shards a couple of magma bolts there he goes good times so you can see that this one guy's managed to beat off not a sizable independent force but at least he's managed to kill some of them which is always very very nice the benefit as well that you have after the benefit you have as well after the battle is you now have your wear hyena that you can turn into he will keep all of his equipment. You can see that he has the same equipment slots as he did as a normal human. And he can now sneak out of this province in order to not be detected by enemies and be able to fight somewhere else in future turns, should you wish. Not only that, but that if he's in his human form, if he runs out of hit points, he will then turn into his wear hyena form and you're able to use that second pool of HP with the soul vortex, with the high protection that you have. And he's very good against mundane troops. So moving on to generic thugs, we're going to talk about the Bane Lord or the Bane. Both are viable options for thugging. The Bane Lord has higher HP and he needs less gear off the bat, while the Bane costs less gems to summon, while the Bane costs less gems to summon and is earlier in the research tree. But they'll probably need to operate in higher numbers or be better equipped in order to deal with independence. For this example, we have a Bane Lord with a fear causing hell, stone skin boots to give him stone skin, a stone bird to give him some extra attacks and some protection bracers in order to improve his protection. This means he has pretty good protection. He's sitting at 24 on his head, 17 on his body, and 50 natural protection thanks to stone skin, which gives him some pretty decent protection overall. 30 on the head, 26 on the body. This protection, in addition to his hit points, means he can take quite a lot of damage. And not only that, but he has his fear aura thanks to his horror helmet giving him plus 5 fear, so as long as he's in the fight he'll be causing enemies to rout. Because of this, he's able to deal with most province defences and small to medium independent forces. And as for scripting, he's a lot easier than some of the mages that we've used earlier. For our script, we just have him sitting right at the front on attack closest. He's just going to charge into the enemy lines and see what's what. You could also put him on attack rear, but we can see from his stats he doesn't have the highest com combat speed, so it probably won't do very much. Still, you never know. If archers are just sitting there shooting him, he could get around the back and kill the commander. So moving into the battle so we can see him charging forward, he's going to take a couple of lance hits here and that's absolutely fine, he takes a little bit of damage but thanks to his protection he's able to deal with that. The stone birds here are going to attack these guys that are surrounding him, they'll get more attacks as there's more units around. And we'll just speed this up. So as he's fighting you can see that he's causing them to fear right here, just from his fear aura, while he's able to just sit there and just tank up all of these militia and these art, these light cavalry as well. And he's able to route them fairly successfully. He lost barely any HP thanks to his high protection. And he's done absolutely fine. Now the issue with the Bane Lord is this is quite a lot of gems. It's quite a lot of gems to summon a Bane Lord. Then you've got additional gems for all the magical items that he has. So what could you do instead? Well instead you could kit out a Bane. So what if you want to kit out a slightly cheaper thug? Well you have the Bane here. He has less hit points, less defense skill, less attack skill. But his protection is not too bad. We've given him a bark skin amulet. Give him braces of protection and a horror helmet. So we can see here that even though he isn't quite reaching the level of protection that our Bane Lord did with his stone skin, he's still got decent protection and he's much cheaper on gems because these are both five gem items and this one's a ten one. But it's very, very useful for your thugs just so they can deal with the province defense. Otherwise, you could additionally do it so that he had the a frost brand or some other way of just clearing out chaff. But his Bane Blade's good enough to kill individual units. 
So once again, we've just for his script, we've just set him to be up the front, attack the closest, and he's going to charge into the independence. So here he goes, just going to charge on forward, a little bit of the cold coming out, you can see here it's a little bit chillier in this province, he's able to tank up these arrows thanks to his protection, he is taking a little bit of chip damage, but that's to be expected. Took a big hit there, again his defense skill isn't as good as the Bane Lord. he doesn't have the bird either, so he's really just relying on being tanky enough to outlast their attacks, and then the fear aura to get them to rout, which shouldn't be a problem. We can see there's actually quite a lot of friendly fire occurring as well from these units as they're just hitting uh, other independent troops. And they charge on in, they're trying to take him out. He's got a little bit of a cold aura going on here, so that's going to help him slightly, and he's able to rout the independent forces. So how do I rate these two? The Bane is obviously the cheaper of the two, both in terms of summoning cost and overall kit, whereas the Bane Lord is going to be able to do much more. The Bane Lord still isn't quite able to take out an army, especially if it's an army with mage support on his own, but he's a much heavier thug than just an individual Bane. Unfortunately, they don't have any special map move, but they've got a map move of 20 just because the fact that they're undead would make them very, very good. Just keep an eye out because you obviously don't have any stealth either, so that is a problem. They are, however, poor amphibians, so you can use them to expand under the water as well. If you want to further expand on this, you could summon a Wraith Lord, who's then also a Death Caster, with the same kind of chassis, and he can kind of become a small super combatant, able to take on armies by himself. Okay, for another generic thug, we have the example of the Golem. I've had a couple of requests to say, how do you kit out a Golem? This is one of the ways you can do it. You don't necessarily have to do it the same way as me. It's going to entirely depend on your magical paths as to what you can give him. But this is a fairly basic kit that you can give your Golem for him to be useful in battle. He has a vine shield, so you can get two squares per round with entanglement around him, and then a frost band so that he can do some area of effect damage. This entangle is going to work really well in reducing the enemy's defense skill, so his eight attack skill, which is pretty bad. Well, I guess he's got nine with a frost band, but his nine attack skill isn't the best, so entangling his enemies will make it so that he's able to deal with them. He's got a horror helmet again, just for some additional fear. He has a lion pelt for the invulnerability and some extra HP. This will give him 24 protection against mundane attacks, which is fantastic. Lots of uh, protection on his head. Not so much on his body, but meh, you know, it's not too bad. And then he has a girdle of might for some extra reinvigoration. You could swap out this girdle of might for Boots of the Messenger. Both do the same thing. Boots of the Messenger is actually a little bit better because it also increases your map move. But what you give him is entirely up to you. As for his positioning, we position him right up the back and we've got him casting Astral Shield and Body Ethereal. So the Astral Shield also helps with his low attack skill in that it has a chance to paralyze anybody attacking him if they fail a magic resistance check. And then he's casting Body Ethereal as well. That just makes it so that most non-magical weapons will just pass through him, giving him a good chance of negating hits, giving him a good chance of reducing the number of hits that he takes in battle. So let's have a quick look. So he's just going to sit here, he's going to cast up his buff, his astral shield, and then he's going to cast his body ethereal. Fantastic. So we can see here now, he's ethereal, he's going to have 75% of all those non-magical weapons just missing him. Fantastic. And then he's going to run in to attack the enemy. They're going to fire off all of their bows, they're not going to really do anything, he's going to come up with his frost ban. They've run out of things, the fear effect's starting to take their toll, everybody's getting either paralyzed or they're getting entangled by the roots. And then he's just going to keep marching forward and just killing the, these people here, one square at a time thanks to his frost bands, area of effect damage. Clearing out one or two soldiers every single round. And look at that, fantastic. Clear out those trees, they aren't doing anything to him. And he's taking barely any damage at all over the course of the fight, fantastic and they crumble away, and the independent forces are routed. As our last example, I thought we'd have a little look at the Iron Angel, just because it's a, an interesting idea for a thug, in that it is a non-spellcaster, but it does have the flying map move that you want. How do we kit this one out? Well, that's pretty simple. We just give it a vine shield, we give it a frost band, or a helmet to give it a little bit of extra fear, but I'm not even sure if that's really necessary, and a girdle of might. Good thing about these Iron Angels is the fact that their protection is so high base, so even without the Horror Helmet, they have really good protection on their body and on their head. And that's just thanks to the fact they get Black Steel full plate for their body and they get a Black Steel Helmet as well for their head. Chuck on a Vine Shield for that for some entanglement. Chuck on a Broad Frost Brand as well. Chuck on a Frost Brand as well just to do a bit of damage and these guys can really do some work. Technically, you don't even really need the Vine Shield. You could take that off for a second Frost Brand. These guys are ambidextrous, so they do take less attack penalty. 
in comparison, and they already have pretty good defense skill. As for the script, it's a very, very simple one. These guys are going to stand at the back, they're going to hold for two turns and then attack the rear. Because they are flying, they have a chance to be able to fly over and hit the enemy commanders, which is exactly what we want. We can, if we can kill off the enemy commanders, we can cause a lack of commander route on the enemy army and clear them out that way. So coming into the battle, it's a fairly simple one. We're just going to hold for two turns and fly on in. The enemy force is going to start moving up. We can see their commanders are here at the back. In comes the Iron Angel, just jumping in around the commanders and tangling them up. And now he's just going to go to town, just attacking them off. Some of the guys are going to start fear routing because of the Horror Helm. And we can see that he's taking barely any damage, or at least enough damage that we don't really care about. Just a little bit of chip damage just from these uh, attacks here. He's got high enough protection that he's not going to get hit very much. And then you can see that he's just able to wipe them out Lickety split with his frost brand. If he had two frost brands, he might take a little bit more damage, but he probably also could have cleared things a little bit easier. So that's some information about thugging. When looking for thugs, look for commanders with good base equipment or statistics, or the magic pass to make most out of your current research and kit them out for battle against your enemies. Thugs are a fun way to play the game. Even if they aren't the best at the moment, go to get your heroes to fight against the enemy like they do in the tales of old. And with that, we'll end this video here. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this has been helpful to you and answers some questions you have about thugging. Please let me know in the comments if there's anything else you'd like me to go over or any future topics you think I should discuss. But until then, take care.